The engineering decision-making process is kind of a combination of an art and a science in a way, because it's a combination of using your own intuition and your holistic design thinking with the hard data that you're collecting from experiments and from simulation and from calculations. Hello and welcome to another exciting episode at the Being an Engineer podcast. Today we have the privilege of speaking with Devin Copeland, an accomplished engineer with extensive experience in hardware engineering and product design. He's currently the co-founder and CTO of Serial, a company that aims to streamline manufacturing data analysis, making it easier for engineers to identify and resolve production issues swiftly. Devin's background includes significant roles at Apple, Tesla, and Arion Labs, where he contributed to the development of high-profile projects like the Apple Watch Ultra and the Tesla Model 3. Devin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. So you've worked at some some pretty impressive places and worked on some really cool high profile projects. Uh, super excited to dig into that and and learn all about your experiences there. But let me start with a simple question: What made you decide to become an engineer? Yeah. So when I think back to my childhood, you know, there's been a lot of engineering related memories that come to mind um, that kind of paved the way. F- paved the way for what was to come. But one of the most uh, formative memories I have, and probably the earliest memory, was actually with my grandfather. He was a, a civil engineer. And one day when I was seven years old, he brought me to the local library in the neighborhood that we grew up in, in Vancouver, Canada. And uh, at the library that day, they had one of those popsicle stick bridge building competitions. And we weren't in the competition that year, but we got to watch as these bridges were loaded up with weight to failure. And I was kind of enamored by uh, seeing this competition take place. And the following year, we entered it together. And I think it was a bit unfair to have, you know, a practice practicing civil engineer uh, pair up with an eight-year-old. But um, we entered the competition nonetheless, and it, it was just a lot of fun. And over the years, my grandfather was a huge inspiration to me. Uh, in becoming an engineer. So I owe a lot to in my career and uh, in my childhood to him. Uh, your grandfather sounds like a, a special guy. And, and what a great story about how you became an engineer. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. Um, the Popsicle Bridges, what a fun challenge and competition, right? We Absolutely. we recently did something similar here at Pipeline. We had a, a quarterly team meeting and we decided to do a little team building event where we had spaghetti straws and marshmallows and a yard of tape, like scotch tape and a yard of string. And the, the design challenge was to build a structure as tall as possible. The only requirement was, well, you could only use those materials and the marshmallow had to end up on top. It was one of the bigger, like roasting marshmallow ones, not the small ones. And that was a lot of fun, right? Engineers, we just love to dig in and, and build things like that. I love it. I love it. And, and you know, I find that the best innovation often comes out of scarcity, right? And when mm. you're just given a, a short set of materials to work with, often, you know, some really fun ideas come out of that. Totally. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. Um, we did this in our office. So there were like the typical office tiles uh, in the ceiling and one of the teams, uh, it, there's still a little bit of a debate about whether this is fair or cheating, but their idea <laughs> was to hang everything from the ceiling and then, you know, distance from the ground to the top of the marshmallow was like far and away higher than anyone else, even I though they hung it from the ceiling instead of having a structure that supported all the way. But technically, you know, that wasn't in the rules. So out of the box like you thinking said, for you. Yeah. Creativity. That's right. Cool. Uh, when you were in college, you, you competed in this American Solar Challenge, and that seemed like kind of a fun project. I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that, maybe a little bit of background about what this challenge was and some of the, the, the hurdles, the challenges that you ran into and how you guys overcame them. Yeah, for sure. So I studied engineering at the University of Waterloo in Canada. And like many other engineering schools around the world, Waterloo has these student design teams. 
Um, I think a lot of people will be familiar with the, like Formula SAE, for example, is kind of a, a student competition. But there's many other different types of student design teams. And the one that interested me the most and that I joined was the solar car team. We call it the Midnight Sun Solar Car Team at the University of Waterloo. And sort of the, the pinnacle of solar car competition in North America is the American Solar Challenge, which happens every two years. And it happens at a different um, part of the U.S. every two years. And uh, in 2018, the year that we competed, we raced from Nebraska to Oregon on a, about a 1,500-mile course on real roads. Wow. I had so, no idea it was that long. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, mm. it's an amazing competition. And uh, these cars are powered partially or fully by the sun, um, collecting energy from solar panels. And these teams typically go through a two-year design build process where they start um, two years ahead of the competition, design up their vehicle, build it all of themselves, and then bring it to the competition. And so you asked a little bit about hurdles. Um, one of the unique aspects of building a solar car at the University of Waterloo was that uh, at this engineering school at Waterloo, we go on internships or co-ops every four months. So at any given time, there's a different cohort of students on mm. campus. And it would be kind of like if you're running a company and you know half the company left every four months and you got a completely new company. So you can imagine that building a car and doing a big engineering project like this with that dynamic of having the team switch up is a big challenge from a communication and a project management standpoint. So along with you know, learning about core, hardcore engineering principles. I think the team grew a lot on the communication and project management side, which, uh, it was a great skill to learn. Yeah. Were there any special tools that you found to facilitate communication? Yeah. At the time we were using, uh, the, the Atlassian suite. So Jira and Confluence and HipChat, uh, which was kind of the precursor to Slack. And, you know, all of those productivity tools were, were really useful. Um, but I, I, you know, a lot of it is nothing new, right? You just over communicate lots of documentation, lots of meetings, yeah. um, video calls when people were remote. How long did it take to make that drive? It was, I think about a two week journey, uh, maybe just under two weeks around 10 days. Wow. And I'm I'm curious, you said every two years there is a new design cycle. Are you building on what previous teams have done or are you completely starting from scratch every two years? We we really try to build on the successes of, of prior cars. You know, it's it's a lot to take on to engineer everything from scratch every yeah. two years. So it really helps in these student design teams uh, to build on prior successes. And that's not unique to solar car, you know, formula SAE does the same thing. Even like formula one does this, right. You're building yeah. on prior successes. All products do this, right. You start with the MVP. <laughs> Absolutely. And then you yeah. make incremental improvements over time. Right. Yeah. Speaking of products and improvements over time, let's talk about your time at, at Apple and Tesla. Tell us about a couple of the projects that you worked on and, and were there, I mean, what, design principles or philosophies or just best practices did did you take from your experiences working there and um, bring into future roles? For sure. So at Apple and Tesla, unfortunately, I can't go into too many details about specific projects because sure. I want to protect the, the confidentiality agreements that I was subject to and still am. But um, one of the things that I, I would love to talk about is sort of how these roles shaped my thinking around the engineering decision-making process and the way that we as engineers make decisions. And what I mean by that is kind of um, how you des decide between design A, B, or C when you're tackling a problem. When I was uh, in school and, and to a certain extent while I was you know, working on this solar car project, I had kind of the idealized version of the engineering decision process in mind where you know, you're given a list of criteria and constraints, and then you formulate a table and you apply weights to these criteria and constraints, and then you uh, apply some formulas and then out pops the perfect design. And that's kind of what they teach you in school as this sort of idealized decision-making process to select an engineering design that you come up with. But 
when it came to, you know, practicing things in the real world, I began to learn and realize that the engineering decision making process is kind of a combination of an art and a science in a way, because it's a combination of using your own intuition and your holistic design thinking with the hard data that you're collecting from experiments and from simulation and from calculations. And it's also uh, brings in the aspect of working with real people and real company politics and sort of convincing people that the route that you'd like to take is the correct route. So I really loved um, learning about this at, at Apple and Tesla. And I think, you know, like many great engineering companies, they really have a great process for coming to engineering design decisions. I, I love that you talked about um, kind of the non-engineering aspects of engineering, right? Doing engineering as a career is not just doing engineering. It's navigating um, office politics and things like that that we don't necessarily think of in school and maybe that we don't really want to deal with, but it's just a part of life. I wonder, Absolutely. is there... Um, not necessarily of like office politics or bureaucracies or anything like that, but can you think of an example at one of your, your past companies or any really engineering experience that you've had where you had an idea and you felt that your idea was, was the right path and you had to convince others that that was the case. And, and how did you go about doing that? For sure. Yeah. I mean, so many different circumstances have kind of been that sort of thing where you have an idea and um, it might differ from the concept that somebody else has had. And I think, you know, there's a ton of tools that I've put in my toolbox over the years to to um, articulate designs and to show people or try and convince people or, or just you don't necessarily even have to convince people. It's more just about having a productive, uh, engaging discussion to, to come to an agreement on the design. And, you know, some of those tools have been um, putting together nice visuals and slides and um, really telling a story more than just articulating a whole bunch of facts, right? When you're talking to somebody and you're trying to communicate your opinion or your realization, really what you're trying to tell is a story. And so practicing those storytelling practices of putting visuals on a slide and talking to those slides has been something that I really learned uh, at my prior roles. I have a background in, in photography and I've always appreciated graphic design and just visual, what's the word I'm looking for? Not just making something functional, but, but making it look visually appealing as well. And I think that, uh, that's really a useful skill to have, um, because of exactly what you just talked about, which is storytelling. And, and part of the storytelling experience is, is how you make people feel. And the right graphics can really do a great job of that. I'm curious, were there any, I mean, did you pick up Photoshop or, uh, video editing or, or any of these kinds of skills as, ways to enhance your storytelling. One thing that I did to enhance the storytelling, which I found really useful was using uh, animations. And in a lot of times they were just GIFs. Um, one of the challenges though, was that while working in a sort of confidential environment, it can be tough to use those online GIF mm -hmm. editing tools, right? You don't want to be uploading pictures of, right. your, <laughs> of your CAD to some random website. So one thing I did was I made a little macro little uh, script on my computer where I could take a series of screenshots that were cropped in the exact same bounds mm. over and over again. And then stitch those together into a GIF and this thing would run all locally. So none of these screenshots would ever leave my computer. But then I could very quickly, you know, take a whole series of screenshots of a CAD assembly and animate that into um, an animation that could be put on a slide or sent in an email or anything like that. And just having a little bit of motion in the image often goes a long way. So I highly recommend any mechanical engineers who are listening to figure out some way to get animations out of your CAD software in a really quick way. Great advice. I love that. That's so practical. People can go do that right away. Excellent example and advice. So people listening to this, probably a lot of them out there are either already in product design or they're 
interested in, in going into product design. I know there are quite a lot of students that listen to this show and probably some of them are still kind of deciding what direction they want to go into. For those, uh, for those listening who are, are considering going into a product design, um, leg of engineering, what advice do you have for them? My biggest advice is just to work on side projects in your spare time as they are interesting to you. And, you know, people tell me or ask me, what side project should I build or what side project would give me the most opportunities in my career or be best on a resume or whatever. And to be honest with you, I really think it doesn't matter what you work on so long as it's exciting to you and that you're learning something new in the process. There have been so many side projects that I've worked on just out of interest that I had no idea would come back in the future and kind of really help me out at one point or another in my career. Um, one example of that, if you're interested, is um, web development, actually. And uh, when the pandemic hit and we were all kind of stuck at home in COVID, I sort of picked up an interest in web development and started building a couple of of these uh, interactive web apps in my spare time for, for different purposes in my personal life. And uh, I had no idea at the time that web development would be useful to me at all in the future. I was working mechanical engineering and product design related roles at the time. So it wasn't really related to the career that I was on. Um, but having that experience of building websites and building web apps and on the side really, really came into play and became useful when we started uh, the startup that I'm working on right now, Serial. Mm, I, I love it so much. Everything you're saying, I think is just totally 100% spot on. Um, I, I mentioned photography for it. For some time, I ran on the side a photography company with a friend of mine. I started a small web design business myself way long, long time ago. Nothing too sophisticated, but, you know, building out the HTML and the CSS. Back then I was using Dreamweaver. I don't think anyone uses Dreamweaver these days, but that's how long ago it was. And, uh, the, and some video editing is kind of part of the photography and, and part of the web design. And I use those skills all the time now as, as a business owner, because I'm doing a lot of the marketing and the business development and getting really nice pictures of things that we've developed and putting some videos, some case studies together. It really helps display that work and, um, helps us communicate to our customers what we can do. So those are things that, that I've used for years and years and years that, uh, they're not really related to engineering at all, but they sure have come in handy. I remember this is something I wanted to to touch on, uh, especially for the younger engineers out there that are are about to enter the field and are going to be looking for full time jobs or even internships. Frankly, um, I think it's really important to be willing to do some free work. Uh, s some work that you're not going to get paid for and, and understand that that's just, that's kind of part of, um, the, uh, the, the ritual of getting into a professional field. When I was in college, I wanted an internship at this local company and, uh, it was, um, kind of a smart pipe drilling something or other. I can't even remember at this point, but I, I got an interview somehow with the company. And I went on their website and I, I was just looking at their products and I was going to interview to do uh, some CAD design internship role. And so I just started creating CAD models of like all of these products that I saw on their, on their website. I was pretty good at CAD already. So I, I probably created three or four different CAD models that, that, you know, the internals weren't there, but on the outside, they looked just like what you saw on their website. And so I went to this interview. And they asked me a few questions and then I took out this short portfolio, right? And I gave it to them and said, here, like, you want someone who can design products? I've, I've designed the products that I saw on your website. And they were like, oh, wow, that's, yeah, okay, you can do this. And, and I got hired, right? And if I hadn't spent, I don't know, it was a few days, right? Of, of quote unquote free work stuff I wasn't getting paid for, but it was tremendously valuable and, and totally paid off. That's awesome. I love that story. And, it really shows your initiative too, right? That you came into that interview with something different. It differentiates you from whoever else was interviewing. And, you yeah. know, even if you hadn't have got that job, you probably learned something in the process by Definitely. practicing that your cat skills. So yeah. never lost time working on side projects like that. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Side projects are super, super important. 
So uh, let's talk about cereal a little bit. Uh, tell us a little bit about what cereal is and um, why. Uh, w- what prompted you to start the company? Absolutely. So first of all, cereal is spelt with an S, not a C. We often get confused with the breakfast product, but we are cereal with an S, like cereal number. And cereal is a traceability first manufacturing software. So what do I mean by that? Well, when we think about traceability, um, the kind of boring definition uh, that, that you might see on the internet is sort of tracking and documenting the history, the location, the usage of all your components in the manufacturing life cycle. But um, what I try to think about traceability as and what we like to think about it as at Serial is having a digital twin for every product that you produce, where all of the manufacturing records are tied to this digital twin that lives in your traceability system. Now, traceability, um, having this digital twin, it's usually done for one of two reasons, uh, either done from a quality perspective or a regulatory reason. This is often the case in medical devices, as I'm sure you're super familiar with. Or it can be run um, from the perspective of having better analytics and a much easier way to run experiments on your production or on your parts. And when my co-founder, excuse me, when my co-founder and I were thinking about software that we'd used in our past at, you know, our past roles, companies like Apple and Tesla, and especially smaller companies that um, were not Apple and Tesla and maybe didn't have the same capabilities to build their own resources or buy expensive software tools. We really felt that traceability was a big gap. So that's why we started Serial. Um, we want to make the best traceability tool for small to medium manufacturers uh, that need a really robust system for tracking all of their manufacturing data and having these digital twins. So when you say traceability tool, is is Serial... Uh, a PLM, or or should we think of it differently than a PLM? Yeah, we can think of it as a lightweight MES. So more on the manufacturing side, manufacturing execu- execution system is okay. MES um, that has a really robust traceability component, meaning that we can um, track the geneal, the as built bomb, the as built genealogy of the products that you're producing as well as capture any sort of data that you want to capture along the way. So if you want to know um, a dimensional measurement on a particular part, you can log that in serial. If you want to know the you know, final quality inspection report um, that may be produced by an automated test fixture, that can be logged in serial. Uh, things like operators and station IDs and date codes, lock codes, that can all be tracked in serial as well. Very cool. All right, I'm going to take a very short break here and share with the listeners that the Being an Engineer podcast is brought to you by Pipeline Design and Engineering, where we don't design pipelines, but we do help companies develop advanced manufacturing processes, automated machines, and custom fixtures, complemented with product design and R&D services. Learn more at teampipeline.us. The podcast is also sponsored by The Wave an online platform of free tools, education, and community for engineers. Learn more at thewave.engineer. We have the privilege of speaking with Devin Copeland today. So, Devin, you you just talked about maybe you have this automated fixture that's feeding data into an MES. We, uh, we just delivered a piece of automated machinery that we developed, and this machine has some vision systems in it and glue dispensing. And there are two side covers that receive glue. And then the vision system inspects that glue and ensures that A, a sufficient volume has been deposited and B, uh, that the glue has been um, deposited in the the correct locations on the side cover. And then the two side covers come together and they get, they get glued together. So uh, every time an inspection is performed with this vision system, it takes some pictures and there's, you know, there's a, a pass fail um, criteria. And so this is, this is the type of thing that you're referring to when you're talking about data that, that feeds into serial. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's at least three or four different data points that you just mentioned there that could be logged in serial and could be really useful if there was ever a quality issue or a recall or some sort of concern later down the line when you manufacture these parts. 
And so, like you mentioned, the picture could be uploaded, the pass fail result, the volume of the glue. If you had multiple of these stations, multiple of these glue dispensing fixtures, you might have the, the actual fixture ID be logged as well. And later on, you might find that there's some sort of commonality or trend as associated with the fixture itself. One fixture dispensing glue suboptimally. And that will all kind of shake out in the data if you're tracking it and tracing it properly in your system. How would, um, let's say that something does go wrong in the field, a device fails or something. Well, what's an example of how data from serial could be pulled to help identify the, the root cause? Absolutely. One thing that that makes me think of is a, is a sort of a, failure analysis strategy called commonality analysis. And I think when we're doing failure analysis as engineers, it's often really easy to figure out uh, what went wrong, but not why it went wrong and mm. kind of getting really deep to that root cause. And commonality analysis can be a really powerful tool in getting to that root cause because what it allows you to do is it allows you to aggregate a few different or uh, all of the failures um, of the same mode together. So if there was a glue failure and this happened on say, you know, four or five different parts, you could look at that sample four or five different parts and you could say what's similar between all of these things. Play a little bit of game, a bit of a game of spot the difference. And then what might shake out is, you know, all of these parts went through the same glue fixture or they all had a mm. sort of on the low range of the glue volume dispensed. Or you could look at the pictures and you could sort of look at it from a qualitative perspective. Is there a specific pattern here? And running these commonality analysis is, analyses is something that um, becomes really easy in Serial when you have good traceability on your components. So does Serial include the tools for running these analyses or just the data and then you export the data and use external tools? No, we absolutely do include those tools. So we're an analytics package as well as the database and data collection package. Nice. Very cool. Talk a little bit about, uh, I mean, there are MES systems out there, right? Um, what, what did you see as lacking in the market and kind of what, what hole are you trying to fill with serial? Absolutely. So I think what a lot of this comes down to is the challenges that manufacturing engineers and engineers face when they're trying to do analysis and run experiments on their production line. And we found that there's kind of a tendency for it to be very difficult to get high quality analytics and to run experiments on manufacturing lines. So why is this? Well, I think it comes down to two things. One is a tendency for uh, engineers to, or, or manufacturing processes to kind of ignore the product's genealogy when they think about data collection. And then also a tendency to have very diff, uh, excuse me, disparate methodologies of collecting this data. So, so what do I, what do I mean by this? So from a genealogy perspective, I think engineers, specifically mechanical engineers, you know, really get the idea of having a hierarchy or a genealogy, right? Like in your CAD software, we have sub assemblies and we have top level assemblies and we have individual parts. But then when you kind of get to the manufacturing line and when you're thinking about data collection, often that kind of takes a back seat and we sort of just collect data where we can and we don't really structure it the same way that the product is built. And that comes into play later on to make it really difficult to run a high quality analysis. And then the other aspect I mentioned was having disparate methodologies of data collection. What I mean by that is just having like a lot of different places where you're collecting data. So you might have a spreadsheet in one case and a notebook in another case and a network drive in another case. And having all of these different locations where you have to go to collect your data is kind of difficult. So what Serial does is kind of solves those two problems where we structure the data the same way that your product is built. We really respect the genealogy and the hierarchy. And then we also give it one home and we can collect data from all different sources on your production line and even different production lines or different factories in different countries even. Mm, very cool. Um, what 
if you could summarize the environments for which cereal is the best fit, it's really a perfect slam dunk for, for these kinds of manufacturing environments. And then conversely, for what kinds of manufacturing environments is cereal just not the right tool? For sure. So we specialize in complex assemblies, specifically ones that are electromechanical and have lots of serialized or lock controlled parts that go into the final assembly. So if you're just, you know, injection molding plastic forks, this is not something that cereal would be great for because each one of those plastic forks doesn't have its own unique identifier. But often in um, aerospace or medical devices or personal electronics or industrial equipment, a lot of the sub assemblies and piece parts that go into your final assembly have lot uh, lot IDs, material IDs, serial numbers that you kind of want to keep track of and have an as-built genealogy or an as-built bomb for every product that you produce. And that's specifically the type of industry that uh, we're really specialized for. Great. Great. Terrific. Very clear. If I have a manufacturing line right now and I don't have any kind of MES, but I know I need to, what kind of preparation should I do so that implementing the the MES, whether it's cereal or or something else altogether, what kind of preparation should I do to make that integration process as seamless as possible? For sure. Well, I think the best thing to do is sort of get familiar with the MES space before you dive into that. I would recommend to any manufacturer who's thinking about bringing something on like this, before you you know, make any changes internally, go and explore the space and schedule meetings with companies, schedule demo calls, because you'll probably learn a lot from just seeing what options are available there and making any changes internally are always super costly, right? You don't want to touch a process that's already working. So don't change anything to start. Just go and learn, go and explore. Um, and then once you do uh, pick out something that you're trying to bring on, I think it's really important to have very clear um, documentation of what the process flow is. And different MES softwares can even help you with that by having built-in flow charts and ways to visualize the process. But having a sort of very clear view with everybody on the same page of what the process flow is and what happens at each step is super helpful. And then also having you know SOPs or work instructions documented as well can really help um, communicate to whoever you're working with, with implementing this MES, how your process runs. How about the, the nitty gritty details of how your production equipment communicates with an MES? Are there like just foundational elements that have to be there? Otherwise, y- you can't even do the communication. For example, uh, equipment has to be PLC based with, with sufficient IO versus, um, I don't know, running off some kind of Windows based system. You're talking about serial specifically or just any MES? MES in general. Gotcha. Yeah. I think the, you know, the, the biggest requirement is some sort of network connection. So I think people often want to have these cloud connected or internal server connected, um, machines or pieces of equipment in their factory. And the first thing that you need is some sort of either on-prem network or internet access on the factory floor for these devices to communicate with. There are options out there that use cell connectivity as well. Um, so it's not necessarily a hard requirement that there's connection on the factory floor, but the first thing to figure out is how you're going to, you know, upload the data. And then, yeah, like you said, there's um, different options for different pieces of equipment. At Serial, we have a um, public RESTful API, which basically means that any device that can connect to the internet or a local network can make requests to upload data. Um, but if there's a specific instance with a PLC or some sort of specific piece of hardware, it's sort of like a case by case basis. And it's just best to reach out to the person who's implementing or helping you with the MES to figure that out. Cool. Very cool. All right. Serial is a startup. And let's see, how long has your team been working on this now? About a year and a half or cl- getting close to two years, actually. All right. Well, congratulations on coming up on two years. 
That'll be a big milestone. Thank you. Um, Thank you. What, what have been some of the biggest challenges that you've faced as a startup? What, what are some things that have surprised you, whether good surprises or bad surprises? For sure. I think one of the big challenges for us has just been actually getting the word out there. And I think engineers like myself, we kind of fall into the trap when we're starting a company or starting a startup that, uh, we, we sort of think if you build it, they will come. And, I certainly thought that when I was starting the company, you know, I'm going to build this great piece of traceability software, this lightweight MES for manufacturing. And all of a sudden, all these manufacturers are going to come knocking and, and want to adopt this. And while we have had really, really good feedback from our customers and our early adopters, um, you really have to kind of put your, put the word out there and make sure that people are aware of these new emerging technologies and trends in the field because Sometimes people, uh, rightfully so, are just really, really focused on the task at hand and making, you know, what they're working on uh, in their day to day work as best as possible. Yeah. Um, what have you found to be effective methods of um, going back to the storytelling that you were talking about? Right. What have you found to be effective in terms of getting the word out there about serial? We've been doing a lot of video and multimedia content. Um, we find that that's really engaging and helps people understand really what the product is. It's a, it's a very simple user interface, but some of these ideas, you know, require a little bit more, uh, time and, uh, visuals to communicate what's going on with our product. So, uh, having videos and multimedia posts on social media and stuff like that has been really helpful. Yeah. What, what, um, what social platform have you found to be the most effective at finding your customers? LinkedIn is definitely the best social media platform. I mean, people are on there from a professional and working perspective. So yeah, yeah we find the same as well. Okay. Uh, let's see. I read a little bit about Serial's grid builder and, and how it simplifies the analysis of subassembly data. Can you talk a little bit about that? I think it's best to talk about the grid builder and this feature in general uh, in terms of an example. So let's say that we're building um, a medical device and the medical device is made up of a number of different parts and sub-assemblies. So for sake of discussion, maybe this medical device has a PCB. Uh, it might have some sensors that talk to this PCB. It might have an injection molded housing. Now, all of these parts have potentially different uh, sub line processes or sub assembly processes that happen as you're building the device up. So there might be incoming quality inspections that are done on the housing. There might be a flashing and a firmware uploading process that happens on the PCB. The sensors might have their own testing that's done on them before they go into the final assembly. So there's all these things that are happening asynchronously on their own, on these different parts of the assembly. You're collecting data, you're running procedures, operators are following instructions. And then finally, at the end of the line, uh, all of these parts come together. They might be a final functional test, and then the device goes off into the field. Now, a huge challenge when you're a quality engineer or a manufacturing engineer and you're trying to understand something, you're trying to run an analysis, is aggregating all of the data from these different parts that went through different processes along the production process. So let's say I want to know, you know, is there a strong correlation between sensor level testing and the testing at the end of my production line? That seems like a really easy question that should be able to be answered really quickly. But often this is, you know, hours or days long process to aggregate the data from different places. Then you need to join data from different serial numbers together. So data from the sensor level might be serialized to the sensor subassembly. Mm. And then data from the top level is serialized to the top level assembly. So now you have to spend some time with VLOOKUP in Excel to stitch these things together. And so the grid builder comes in and makes this super, super easy. You drop in a list of serial numbers that you want to analyze, and then you can basically just drag and drop columns. Any data point that you've collected at any point on your manufacturing line, this could even be you know who the operator was that did a particular process, 
or the cycle time of a particular process. Or like I said, the sensor level test measurements. You can just drag and drop these data sets in and construct mm -hmm. your table the way you want it. And we've just released a companion to the grid builder called the graph builder, which is the same thing, but for graphing. So instead of building a table, you're building a plot. That sounds awesome. Uh, is it, would it be inaccurate to think of, um, grid builder and plot builder as kind of like Excel on steroids built specifically for analyzing subassembly data sets? I love that characterization. I love it. It's perfect. Okay. Great. <laughs> Terrific. All right. Well, let's see, Devin, let me, let's do one more question and then, uh, and then we'll wrap things up here. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in any answer you have to this, but I'm specifically interested to hear if there were uh, specific tools that that you learned or observed during your time at Tesla and Apple, because I'm sure they have just tons of very refined processes. And the, the question is, what is one thing that you have done or observed to accelerate the speed of engineering? I think of our mission here at Serial as basically trying to automate busy work so that you can focus more on the task at hand and decisions that really, really matter. And I think that our customers kind of feel this when they start to use our product. But I also want to take that mentality in-house and have it influence how we um, build software and how we run our company. And so some of the things that, uh, we've done to sort of accelerate the speed of engineering within our team is to, to do things that, like I said, eliminate the busy work, eliminate the thought in the mundane tasks. And some of these things are not new to software engineering. Like we automate our validation testing. And so every time there's a new build of the software, we have a whole suite of tests that run against it to make sure we're not playing a kind of a whack-a-mole game where you fix one thing, but you break another thing. Um, we also have a pretty robust style guide and re reusable building blocks. So whenever we're building a new user interface, we have these Lego bricks to use um, that make the user interface really clean and uniform, but also accelerate the speed that we can push out new features. And so I think, yeah, we just really try to make the feeling that people have when they use our product of eliminating the busy work of their day to day, um, also be the feeling that our employees have when they're working in serial and building up new features or new analytics. That's terrific. Great. All right, Devin, what a pleasure it has been to get to know you and a little bit about serial. Thank you for joining me on the podcast and sharing some of your, your insights and background to the field of engineering. How can people get in touch with you? The best way to reach out to me is LinkedIn, Devin Copeland. Feel free to shoot me a connection request. I'd love to hear from any people working in the hardware engineering space. I'm a huge hardware nerd. So I just love, you know, even if it's just a casual conversation, hearing about what people are up to. And then the other place to check us out is serial.io. That's our website, serial with an S, like serial number, dot .io. We have a whole bunch of information there about our product, as well as some videos. Cool. Devin, thank you again. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm Aaron Moncur, founder of Pipeline Design and Engineering. If you liked what you heard today, please share the episode. To learn how your team can leverage our team's expertise developing advanced manufacturing processes, automated machines, and custom fixtures complemented with product design and R&D services, visit us at teampipeline.us. To join a vibrant community of engineers online, visit thewave.engineer. Thank you for listening.